All right, welcome back, folks. Today we're going to talk about oligopolies in a more practical stance um, and look at how they operate kind of in the real world. The information is in your books, Chapter 15 on oligopolies. Um, and we talked last time a little bit about um, why oligopolies have this incentive to cooperate but then begin to uh, watch that co cooperation fall apart as they have these incentives to cheat. And game theory kind of helps us understand uh, the thought process behind why a firm may choose to try and uh, cheat on another in an oligopoly situation. But um, we want to look a little bit more into how uh, firms might actually learn to cooperate with each other. Uh, we know that in, an, in a perfect world, firms would, would love to f form cartels with formalized agreements to, uh, to act as a monopoly together, um, but that's illegal in the United States and, in fact, illegal in most countries. Um, now, it wasn't always that case. Back in the uh, 1800s, we had um, a lot of trusts, a lot of monopolies in business, and uh, the government worked very hard to try and get rid of them, and they formed these antitrust laws to help eliminate formal collusion and formal agreement among parties um, back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And so um, companies like Standard Oil, which had this massive market share, uh, ended up getting broken up and uh, increasing the uh, competitiveness within each of the various markets. But like I said, being able to work together um, is certainly advantageous for companies because it does help them to raise price by eliminating competition. Um, so firms would like to work together um, as much as they can. And so we have what's known as tacit collusion. In tacit collusion, firms do still work together to try and impact price and quantity, but they're going to do it um, in a less formalized way. There's no agreement or contract between the parties. Instead, there's kind of an understanding of how each uh, each party is going to act. Um, and so they will send market signals uh, to each other. So the CEOs don't get together and have a meeting because that would be straight up collusion and, and would get them in trouble. But they might send signals through the market on how they are going to behave in, in a way to try and get other people to react based on the signal that they've sent. It's not always effective, however, um, even with, with tacit collusion, it's not always effective uh, and companies are not always able to control the market as much as they want. And there are several reasons why that's the case. Um, one is that the more firms there are, the less collusion there is because collusion requires all of the firms to work together. So if there are a lot of firms, it's difficult to get all of them to work together and be on the same page. Um, and because there are a lot of firms, it becomes easier and easier for individual firms to cheat on any sort of agreement they might make. So generally speaking, the more firms you have, the less collusion uh, there is and the less likely it is to see any sort of tacit collusion among actors. Another limitation is, is the complexity of the products and the pricing schemes that, um, that firms have. It's difficult to kind of keep track of an agreement when you have very complex pricing schemes. For example, if you're a retailer and you're selling thousands of products, if you're Walmart and you're selling thousands of products, and you make an agreement with other retailers about each of the products that you're selling, how can they possibly kind of keep track of whether or not you're actually following through on your promise on each one of those several thousands of different products you're selling. Um, another example would be in the cell phone industry where even if the cell phone companies were able to form some sort of tacit collusion on the pricing scheme for their phones, they're still going to try and have differences to try and gain market share from their competitors. They're going to offer different handsets, they're going to offer different uh, pricing schemes based on the number of minutes you speak and the number of text you send or the amount of data you download. And so it's difficult for any one firm to, um, or any group of firms to come to an agreement on a set price for the product because there's so many different variables that can go into creating a cell phone package. So the more complex it gets, the more unlikely it becomes that firms will collude in order to set a market price. Another issue has to do with uh, the difference of, of interests. Not every firm is going to agree on how to divide the market. It's not like each firm is going to sit there and happily say, let's just take, if there's five firms in the industry, let's just each take 20%. Um, some firms are going to want more of a market share than others. 
especially if you're an established firm, you're going to want a much larger share of the market than if you're relatively new to the industry. So getting companies to agree on how much they should be producing as part of this tacit collusion is very difficult. Um, and so the more divergent the interests of the firms, the, the more they, they differ on the appropriate role each company should have within the market, the less likely you're going to have collusion. Also, the, the purchasing power of consumers can help eliminate collusion. Um, so for example, you know, Kellogg's and General Mills are the main producers of cereal, but they have a difficult time uh, colluding and, and controlling the price of cereal because they have to sell their products to retailers and there are lots of different retailers and so um, the retailers who buy the cereal in order to sell it to in, end consumers have a lot of power and control over uh, the price of the good so while Kellogg's and General Mills are a strong oligopoly in the production of cereal they have very little market power over the uh, end price of the product so Essentially what we're saying is the more bargaining power uh, a buyer has, the less likely there will be collusion among the sellers. And when collusion breaks down, what we've seen in previous days is that um, once collusion breaks down, there tends to be competition based on price. And that price competition um, generally drives the price down until the outcome begins to approach what a competitive industry would have had. Um, and so when industries have these kinds of characteristics of many firms or complex products or powerful purchasers or divergent interests, we begin to see an outcome that's less like a monopoly and more like competition. Of course, producers don't like competition. They'd much rather act as a monopolist, um, be able to gain economic profits. And so one of the things that they'll attempt to do is to create differences in their products, to have what's known as product differentiation, which allows firms to have power over price by providing either um, real differences in their products or create the perception of differences in their products through things like advertising and marketing. So, um, you know, in the market for, for fruit, maybe you're able to create a product that's an apple or a pear or an orange. Um, each one of them is a fruit, but each one is slightly different, and each one then has a different market associated with it. So if you're the, the sole producers of... Um, of apples, then you have a little bit more control over price, say, than if you were um, competing in this this idea of a fruit industry. So the more differentiation you get, the more power over price you can have. <clears throat> couple of examples. I mean, one is Motrin and Advil. Both of them are ibuprofen. There's really, in essence, no difference between the two products, and yet they are marketed differently and to different audiences to try and create the sense of difference so that there can then be some control over price by their manufacturers. So in this case, the difference between the two products is perceived. It's not really real um, in most cases. We could look at, at athletic shoes, and this is where difference is both perceived and real. I mean, Reebok and Nike both make athletic shoes, um, but each one has a little different um, technology to it, maybe a little different benefit to the creation of their good. And so um, there is sort of a difference between these two goods, um, whether it's air pockets or lightweight materials or whatever it is that they've got. So people are willing to pay a higher price for one shoe over the other because of these features, and that gives market power um, to the maker of that shoe. Another way that firms can kind of work together or attempt to work together and create some market power over price is what we call price leadership. Um, there are times in which there are price leaders that help set the price for a good. If there's an, an oligopoly um, where there's a member of the oligopoly that's large enough and powerful enough, they can kind of send signals to the rest of the industry on how much they should charge for a good. Um, and then other companies will essentially tacitly agree to follow that price. And so oftentimes you see things like suggested retail price for a good is whatever it is. And, um, and many firms that are producing similar goods will generally charge about the same amount um, for that good because they're following the price leader. Another example of price leadership is really in the auto industry, where for years and years there were the big three automakers, um, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, and they generally look towards GM as the largest and most powerful of the three for their hint on how much to charge for products. 
And so GM would set its price, and then the rest of the industry would follow. And we see that even today, where we've got three different cars, the Malibu, the Camry, and the Accord, all three of which are essentially the same vehicle. They have basically the same engine, the same drivetrain, the same horsepower, the same torque, I mean, by and large. Um, you know, they have a lot of the same features, and they're all about the same price. And so, you know... One company sets its price, and then the rest kind of follow. But even in this kind of situation, you do see that they try to differentiate a little bit in order to charge a little bit more than what the, the uh, price leader may have indicated for the base model of, of car. So are oligopolies important? Yes, they're, they're important to understand. They're the primary market structure for, for business um, in most places. The challenge for us is it's not easy to graph. There are there are ways to graph the demand curve for an oligopolis, but it gets kind of confusing. So just conceptually, we focused on kind of the idea of how they might operate. Um, but it is kind of an important structure to understand because it does kind of dominate the business world. We'll do some more practice problems in class when you get in. And um, when we're done with oligopolies, we'll move on to some more market structures. I'll see you soon.